Hello and welcome to Griffin Update. I'm Bernd Rosenauer. And I'm Micah Cummins. Griffin Update is our student-produced digital magazine show bringing you news, sports, and information from Missouri Western State University and the surrounding region. During our show, we will present an in-depth look at the people, places, and events that make Missouri Western and the Northwest region of Missouri a great place to call home. On today's show, we will take you to the dedication of a new addition to the Cronkite Memorial and take in the sights and sounds of the Black Student Union pageant. We also take a look at the end of one era and the beginning of another. And Amari Martin will join us with her sports report. But first, have you ever wanted to travel the world? Well, thanks to the International Student Fair, you can travel around the world in one night. Missouri Western took hundreds of students around the world in one night at the annual International Fair on November 16th. Students enjoyed learning about several countries, eating cultural foods, and listening to different performances throughout the event. Kia Apari, a graduate student from Iran, played a major role in helping set up the event. Uh, I helped with the, uh, the promo video, I mean the, all of the media, like they designed the posters and like promoting the event. I helped with the, uh, organizing some parts of the events, not all of it, and like be in touch with the other organizations and inviting the people. We have like uh, 29 countries, including United States, and uh, like we have, we have at least one country from every continent. Over 800 students were estimated to attend the event. The turnout ended up being well over a thousand. For this year, I think uh, there's something around 60 students are participating, this year, and we are expecting 400 people to show up for the event, at least. Each table got their own like traditional cuisine and like candies and each table got their own price like some specific traditional thing from their country like for Iran we have a uh, what's that uh, like a poetry book and for Russia we have a tea and for other tables so whoever like win at the end we're gonna give them prize and for each table what we did that is like pretty creative uh, we create a passport which we give you at the, at the beginning of the conference. Then, uh, not the conference, I mean, at the beginning of the fair. And uh, each table got their own stamp, like a sticker stamp, so they're gonna stick it to you. So you look like uh, you travel, you've been to all these countries. For the first time at the fair, the United States was able to host their own table. Robert Vardaman, a music business major, gave students facts about America and handed out Twinkies and Twizzlers, a popular American snack. This is the first year I believe that America has been included at the International Fair and I'm really happy that I get to represent it because, you know, a lot of people are already here so of course they know a lot about it, but to see it as represented as part of the International Fair also, you know, I feel like it's a very good thing because, you know, we're, we're here as well, you know, we want to be represented and, you know, it's very exciting. So. I am currently giving out facts about America and also serving Twinkies and Twizzlers for people to enjoy. It was more of a secondary choice for me. I really just wanted to have chicken and tater tots, but uh, the deep fryer was going to be overloaded with a bunch of food because all over the world people have deep fried foods and theirs would probably taste a lot better than what people eat every day here in America. So I just decided, yeah, I'll just go with Twizzlers and Twinkies. But people enjoy those all the time. I am really excited to see Malaysia because I don't think that was here last year, but it probably was. But if it wasn't, then I'm really excited to see it. And also, I really enjoy the Indian table and, of course, the Mexican table. So I can't wait to get over to those places. To honor the lives lost in recent terrorist attacks around the world, a moment of silence was held. Reporting for Griffin Update, this is Micah Cummins and Billy Nolan. For more information on international student activities, visit the International Student Services in Blum Union 210. Hey Brent, as you know, St. Joseph is the birthplace of Walter Cronkite. <sighs> yeah, I know, I've walked through the memorial at least a million times, so what? Well, sitting here under all these lights and looking into this camera over here reminded me of the new exhibit they just introduced. Oh, you mean the mock-up of his CBS studio? Yeah, only their cameras were a little bit bigger. Phase 3 of the Walter Cronkite Memorial at Missouri Western was dedicated during an invitation-only reception on Monday, November 9, 2015. The ceremony was attended by a variety of honored guests. Reporter Eric Tolliver was there for the festivities. Third phase of the Walter Cronkite Memorial at Missouri Western was dedicated during an invitation-only reception on Monday, November 9, 2015. 
The phase three dedication included a replica of the newsroom from which Cronkite anchored on CBS Evening News. The evening also included two live multimedia shows, Cronkite and Harry and Walter, Missouri's native sons. Some honored guests attended the private ceremony and reception that included Pat Conway, Missouri Senator Roy Blunt, and Leslie Moonves, President and CEO of CBS Corporation. Walter Cronkite Memorial Museum was dedicated on November 4th, 2013, what would have been Cronkite's 97th birthday. The memorial, which is housed in the atrium of Lay Spratt Hall, is 5,000 square feet. It is open seven days a week and admission is always free. Walter Leland Cronkite was born November 4, 1916 in St. Joseph, Missouri. He passed away on July 17, 2009 at the age of 92. To learn more about Walter Cronkite or the Walter Cronkite Memorial, plan a trip to the Cronkite Memorial located in Spratt Hall or visit the memorial's website at missouriwestern.edu slash WCM. This is Eric Tolliver with Griffin Update. For more information on Walter Cronkite or the Walter Cronkite Memorial Museum, visit the Western Institute located in Spratt Hall 105 or the Office of the President located in Popwell Hall 218. As we all know, during his time, Walter Cronkite was one of the most trusted men in America. He often delivered to our living rooms the tough issues. I think it's only appropriate that we follow that lead and talk about an important event that took place on campus. What event is that? It was called the Tunnel of Oppression. I think I've heard of it, but I'm not really sure what it's about. Well, reporter Melissa Castor entered the tunnel and brings us this report. In the day-to-day -day grind, it can be easy to take for granted the rights and privileges we have. It can be easy to overlook the plight of others who don't have things as good as we do. Problems can fade into the background when we don't pay attention to them. The Tunnel of Oppression seeks to open the eyes of the public and shine a spotlight on the issues of the oppressed. Combining real-life stories, startling statistics, and the talents of actors and actresses, the Tunnel of Oppression gives an unsettling look into the lives of minorities all over the United States. The tunnel explores issues such as racism, domestic violence, sexual assault, homelessness, and much more. Using the portrayal of actors and actresses, we see the desperate circumstances that some people face on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I first saw the Tunnel of Oppression two years ago when I was a freshman, and it was really, really intense. And it was also very important because, you know, these things happen every day and people, most people don't know how to respond to it and most people don't respond to it. So that's why we do it and that's why it's really important. So when we do things like this, it is to have people open their eyes and to uh, teach them how to respond appropriately. So. The Tunnel of Oppression was arranged by the Center for Multicultural Education and Coordinator Latoya Fitzpatrick told Griffin Update a bit about the event. We had to uh, gather volunteers to actually come up uh, and write out all the facts that you saw on the um, on the drapings throughout the tunnel. We did that over the summer, um, and then we also had to um, send out. Uh, you know, emails, press releases, all that kind of stuff to get information out about the tunnel and then also to get people to sign up to be debriefers, um, tour guides, actors, um, all of the above. Students who went through the tunnel were shocked at some of the situations they witnessed. It's one of those things that you kind of, after a while, you disassociate with and you're just like, yeah, this is a problem, but I don't have to care about it. So you come out of it feeling really uncomfortable, feeling really like you really want to do something about it. To conclude, the event allowed students to process the information they learned, talk things through, and put forward their opinions on the matter of oppression. The tunnel made students face the harsh reality of those living in oppression. Some things that they may not have known were, one out of every 33 men will experience sexual assault in their lifetime. One of every six women will be assaulted on a college campus. 80% of the women assaulted know their attacker. One in three women and one in seven men have been victims of severe physical violence by an intimate partner. There are 
20,000 or more calls placed to domestic violence hotlines daily. Only 34% of people who are injured by an intimate partner will receive medical care. Black children are 18 times more likely to be charged as an adult in court. 20% of Hispanic females live under the poverty line. The threat of going to jail is 32% in black males, 17% in Latino males, and only 6% in white males. Only 1 in 10 men and women with eating disorders will receive treatment. 10 to 15% of sufferers are male. The ideal body portrayed in media is possessed naturally by only 5% of American women. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. The Tunnel of Oppression gives us a grim look into those living in oppressive, terrifying, and often hateful situations. The Tunnel wants to promote awareness of these problems so that this generation can be the start of positive change in the lives of the oppressed. This is reporter Melissa Castor for Griffin Update. For more information about the Tunnel of Oppression, contact the Center for Multicultural Education at 816-271-4150. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We start out this block with the always amazing annual Black Student Union pageant hosted on Friday, November 13th and the annual fashion show on Saturday, November 14th. Reporter Eric Tolliver reports. Black Student Union hosted a weekend of back-to-back -back events from November 13th to the 14th, 2015 in Kemper Recital Hall. BSU started off the weekend with their annual Mr. and Mrs. Black Student Union pageant and concluded with their annual fashion show, Fifty Shades of Melanin. Mr. and Mrs. Black Student Union were crowned at the fourth annual Black Student Union pageant. This year's pageant was hosted by 2014's Miss Black Student Union, Miss Asia Beasley, and MWSU student governor, Mr. Lionel Italia. Each contestant showcased a talent, gave a speech on a selected social topic concerning the black community. The winners of the pageant were Mr. Paul Granberry and Miss Eugenia Wallace. Initially, I felt, I felt good, but I'm gonna try not to let the title affect my character, but let my character speaks for itself. I was excited, but I was relieved at the same time. It was a lot of work put into this pageant and it took a great deal of support to get through it. So I was, I was relieved and I was happy. As winners of the pageant, they will receive a scholarship. The scholarship includes serving as members of Black Student Union's executive board and an all expense paid trip to the 2016 Big 12 Conference on Black Student Government. The Big 12 Conference on Black Student Government will be held at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas in February 2016. Honestly, just tips and strategies and ways to empower African American students on my own campus. Learn about different ways to unite, you know, just not black people but white people and other races as well to come together. Basically, what I expect to gain from Big 12 is just ways to teach me how to become a leader, become more well rounded, if that makes any sense. And just come in with the open mind, respect other religions, races, or just dealing with with the problems in America today. Black Student Union concluded their weekend with their annual fashion show, Fifty Shades of Melanin. 
This event consisted of a packed house for the evening. It was a time to celebrate the successful entrepreneurs in the African American community. The show consisted of a variety of different clothing lines and musical performances. To learn more about Black Student Union events or the Big 12 Conference on Black Student Government, visit the Center for Multicultural Education located in Blum 210. This is Eric Tolliver with Griffin Update. For more information on the Black Student Union and their upcoming events, you can visit their weekly meetings Tuesdays at 5 p.m. in Spratt Hall 205 or visit their faculty advisor, LaToya Fitzpatrick, in the Center for Multicultural Education located in Blum Union 210. Our next two stories are about the end of one era and the beginning of another. In our first story, we sit down with Julia Schneider, Library Director at Missouri Western. Julia has been the force and innovator at the library since she began working there in 1971. In our chat, she describes the changes she has seen while working here at Missouri Western. As first semester comes to an end, so does a longtime employee's time here at Missouri Western. Julia Snyder has been serving Missouri Western as the library director for 40 plus years and will be retiring this December. Well, through 44 years, it's been a lot of change. Um, when I first came on board, it was September of 71, 1971, oh and there were only a few buildings out here. The trees were teeny tiny. There wasn't a lot of grass. Oh um, everything was kind of barren. Uh, so how would you say Missouri Western has changed you yourself personally? Oh, wow. Um, every day is a new adventure. You never know who's going to knock on your <laughs> door or give you a phone call or send you an email for some information. So um, I think uh, through the years, that has changed. The, the Western, what's one thing you want everyone in the whole school to remember most about you? Hopefully that I, that I made a difference in students' lives. And, and the one thing that we try to do here is not only give people information or push information to them, but we want to show people how to find information for themselves. So we teach information literacy. We teach how to find the information mm -hmm. so that it's a lifelong learning experience for the student. Not They were from the old, old junior college, and so I've saved some of them. But see, this is a 1915 book. This is a 1913 book. But these cards were done by hand. And now we don't even have card catalogs. No, we don't. It's, it's been a fun 44 years, and it's gone really fast. There's Please join Missouri Western in extending best wishes to Julia Schneider, director of the Missouri Western Library, on her retirement. Missouri Western is also seeing the beginning of a new era. This is the first year for director of speech and debate, Jason Edgar. Jason and his team are already proving that they can be successful on the national stage. Speech and debate is much more than arguing points and counterpoints for Missouri Western's speech and debate team. It is quick, precise planning and skill that makes them successful. There's usually six preliminary rounds where you are given a resolution and then you have 20 minutes to prepare a case for and against. And you have a judge in the back of the room who decides the individuals that are going to win the debate given the speeches you were just giving. So they decide A, who the best speakers were, ranking them from 1 to 4, and then gives them a ranking of 1 to 30 30 being the best and one being the worst on how they spoke during the round. In just three years of existence, the speech and debate team has already had enough success to be nationally ranked. According to National Parliamentary Tournament of Excellence, the team is ranked 22nd nationally. It's both proud for us as like a statement of pride for like a D2 young program to be where we are nationally, um, but also something that like we hold ourselves to because uh, we were ranked for a good portion of last year and as well as this year. Um, and so now at this point, we get frustrated if we're not in the top 25. Um, it's kind of about establishing an attitude to stay there. Some of their success comes from a vital skill called rapid talking that is essential for staying competitive at tournaments. So, yeah, rapid talking is kind of an art form. You, there's a lot of ways to practice. Um, like one example that you, we specifically do is like try to not focus on the words that you're about to say. Uh, so you'll like read backwards or add words in between whatever you're reading. Uh, that way it trains your mind to not think uh, as you're reading it quickly. And then the breaths kind of just come naturally. 
uh, just because you're saying so much, you like have to breathe. All of the practices, traveling, and tournaments have brought everyone close together and keeps them coming back every year. The team that brings me back in, like my debate partner is by far one of my best friends. And if I ever have problems, he's really quick to help me through it. And the people in the community are always fantastic, willing to help you with anything, even if they you just beat them or they just beat you. You're able to go out for dinner together afterwards and laugh like nothing happened before and you're still best of friends. It's just incredibly welcoming and inviting and it helps keep a smile on my face throughout the entire tournament. With Griffin Update, I'm Michael Penn. Griffin Update, I'm Michael If you're interested in joining the debate team, contact the Director of Speech and Debate, Jason Edgar, in the Communication and Journalism Office, 207 Murphy Hall. Recently, members of Griffin Update, the Griffin Yearbook, and Griffin News journeyed to Austin, Texas for the National College Media Association Conference. One of the highlights of the trip was a National First Place Pinnacle Award for Griffin Update's own past and present executive producers, Caitlin Cannon and Jenny Swope, for their PSA focusing on sexual abuse. Let's take a look at this national award-winning public service announcement. At Missouri Western, it's on us. It's on us, all of us, to take responsibility and stop sexual assault. To create a campus environment where everyone is safe and feels safe. To realize that ending sexual assault is not an individual endeavor. But a collective effort. To understand that it affects not only students, but faculty and staff members alike. At Missouri Western, we take action. It's on us to look out for each other and not look the other way. We step up and say something. We support survivors. We are going to be a part of the solution and not the problem. It's on us to intervene and take responsibility. So take action because we can and will make a difference. At Missouri Western, it's on us to, to put, put an, an end, end to sexual, sexual assault. assault. Begin by taking the pledge at itsonus.org. Joining me is special guest and the first executive producer of Griffin Update, Caitlin Cannon. Hi, Caitlin, and welcome back to Griffin Update. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about the creation of the PSA? Yeah, um, actually, executive producer Jenny Swope and I, which is actually right over there, uh, we created a PSA for the campaign. It's called It's On Us. It highlights sexual assault on college campuses. Uh, and we collaborated with the Student Government Association and Student Governor Lionel Italia um, to create this PSA just to make people aware that it can happen anywhere. How big of a process was it putting it together? Um, well, there were several phases to it, I would say. There was a lot of planning on Lionel's part, and then he brought it up in SGA, and I was just going as a student journalist, and afterwards, I kind of talked to him and I said, you know, if you need someone help to help film this, uh, I know a couple people and we would love to help you. So that's kind of how we got the ball rolling, and then after that, I met with him a couple times, and. Um, Jenny actually had another project in mind, but luckily she was able to come on board and <laughs> the film quality is much better because of it, so I was really lucky to get to work with her. How many people got involved with the project? Well, on the production side, there were, I'd say about four, me, Jenny, Elliot, and Lionel. And then as far as outreach to the campus, we had a great response. We had students, we had uh, faculty, staff, and administrators in the program, or in the PSA, so um, it was really great to see campus come out and support something like sexual assault. How did you feel getting nominated for a Pinnacle Award? Um, it was interesting, it was humbling. Uh, it's not something I ever expected, especially since I have focused on print journalism for the majority of my college career. So to get a nominee for a Pinnacle Award for something that's broadcast related was really interesting and I just felt really lucky. And <laughs> What was your reaction when you found out that you won? Well, <laughs> um, actually, I got a text from Jenny, and I was driving on my way to work. Um, <laughs> and I don't think I was having a very good day that day, so it was like the best part of my day, actually. It was nice to hear. <laughs> so what are you doing now that you've graduated? Uh, I work at the St. Joe News Press. I am a copy editor and page designer, so I work in the evenings, and I put together the paper. Congratulations on your Pinnacle Award and all of your future endeavors at the News Press, and hopefully beyond that. Thank you. What a special treat. Thank you, Caitlin, for stopping by. We'll be right back with Amari Martin Sports Report. A leading problem I faced is a misunderstanding on the part of students of the importance of academic advising. They miss appointments. They don't make appointments. But what's most disappointing is when they come unprepared. Give me a student with a plan in their head, or better yet, on paper. We could talk about their interests, not just about their classes. 
We could discuss internships, classwork, grad programs. It would open the door to what advising is truly about. Can I help you? But instead, they come to me in a panic when they need to I'm register because- I need to talk to you. I was trying to register for my classes, but it wouldn't let me do it because I need my pin and I haven't had time to set up an advising, so I don't even know what classes I need to take. So I just signed up for a bunch of random ones and I'm gonna drop them later. So can I have my pin real fast? Because I'm still locked into a computer in the lab. Am I interrupting? Take ownership of your education. Make the most of your advisement by being proactive, punctual, and prepared. You'll open the door to more personalized attention and avoid costly setbacks. It's never too soon to begin planning your next steps at Missouri Western. Welcome back. I'm Amari Martin. As football season comes to an end, the Griffin Space rival Northwest Missouri State in one of their final matches of the season. Here's a look at the Griffins taking on the Bearcats. It's rivalry week. The Griffins versus the Bearcats in a packed Sprat Stadium. Western got on the board first. D. Tolliver with a nice grab and walks into the end zone for the 52-yard score. The Griffins lead 7-0. But the Bearcats with an answer comes right back with a touchdown of their own. Phil Jackson puts Northwest on the board. Later, the Bearcats in the red zone comes back with another touchdown, increasing their lead 14-7. A rough night for the Griffins as they fall 24-10 to Northwest. Cortrez Cole report from Griffin Update. As football comes to an end, the basketball season is just beginning. It's that time of the year again, as the men's basketball team hosted the Hillier Tip-Off Classic as their regular season opener. Along with the tournament, they hosted a youth basketball clinic. Reporter and former standout Griffin basketball player Cortrez Colbert gives us an inside look on these events. Opening game for the Grizz, Aaron Emanuel's out due to an injury. The Grizz play Wayne State. A slow start for both teams, but Wes Smith again, his first career start, says he's been here before. He had nine first half points. Later, Cole Clearman kicks it to Trey Sampson. He drains the three. The Grizz had a comfortable lead most of the game. In the second half, the threes kept falling. Miller dishes it to Clearman, and he knocks down the tray. Western's feeling good, but later, the Wildcats cut the lead and tied the game. Under a minute left, West Miller put the team on his back and hits the go-ahead bucket. The sign speaks for itself. West Miller, Steph Curry with the shot. The Grizz won 81-75. Trey Sampson finished with 18 points. West Miller was right behind him with 15 points. Day two of the Hear Your Classic. Every year, the men's basketball team hosts a youth clinic for the kids. Free t-shirts, autographs. Let's go check it out. Ready? One, yeah. two, One, three, 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 right, we're excited to be here. And we're excited to work with y'all. Remember your number. One, two, three. Two, the Grizz still without Aaron Emanuel host Upper Iowa. The last time the two met, the Peacocks came out on top. The inside play has been good for Western as Curry Burry hits the jump hook in the paint. Cole Clerman shot a well from the three, coming off the screen, hitting the big shot here. He had all 12 of his points in the first half. 
but the Grizz trail most of the game. Up for hours, Jimmy Rawls comes off the handoff and gets the easy lay-in. With minutes left in the game, the Grizz down big, but made a late run, cutting lead to just three. Western needs a big shot. The double comes on Mataika, and freshman Miles Winslow hits his only three points of the game. Couldn't be at a better time. Tie game. Western needs a stop. But Carson Parker finds Gerard Gamble for the easy lay-in taking the lead. The Grizz in desperation mode. Curry Burry puts up the three, but falls short. Western falls to Upper Iowa, 86-78. For this week's segment of One on One, I am sitting down with Missouri Western's very own Mike Jordan. Welcome. On this segment of One on One, I am sitting down with Missouri Western's cornerback, Mike Jordan. Welcome to the show, Mike. How you doing? So we first have to talk about your name. I know you get this a lot, but your name is Michael Jordan. You're named after the GOAT of basketball. Is there a story behind your name? Oh, uh, well, not really. My mom just kind of named me Michael. My, my last name is already going to be Jordan, so it's just kind of a basic name. So it's, just, it's whatever. I just go with it. So pretty much you're the GOAT of football, right? Uh, trying to be. <laughs> trying to be. You got your respect early in the league. You were MIAA Freshman of the Year. You were also a part of the 2012 season when we won conference champs. How did it feel to be a part of that? Uh, it felt great. Just knowing that I was along those guys as a freshman and it was a bunch of seniors on that team. And just to be able to help those guys go out on top and get that conference championship was a really, was a really mind changing experience for me. And it, and it kind of helped shape my career. How was it getting to play with your brother? Uh, it was definitely fun, and a lot of people don't get to experience things like that. So me playing football with him for such a long time, like we've always played ball together, and to continue to do that throughout college, is, it was amazing, and I definitely cherish those time together. Did you guys play any other sports together? Uh, nah, he really didn't play any other sports. I, I ran track and played basketball, but football was the only thing we did together. You are one of the top cornerbacks in the league and in the nation, and now you are a nominee for the Cliff Harris Award. How does it feel being honored that award? Uh, it's it's kind of mind-blowing, just knowing that people think that highly of me to nominate me for the, the best defensive player in the in the country on our level. It's, it's, it's crazy, but I'm definitely honored, and win or lose, I would definitely be, hon be honored about that, so I, I'm just very thankful for the opportunity. So what are your future plans after you leave here? Uh, after I leave here, first and foremost, I plan on training and trying to take my shot at going into play professional football, of course. And I'm just going to kind of see how that goes and, and how far that takes me. Well, hopefully we get to do this again when you're in the NFL and I'm on ESPN. <laughs> hopefully so. Thank you for sitting down with me, Mike. Thank you. Stay tuned for more one-on-ones with Amari Martin. For more information on Griffin Athletics, check out GoGriffins.com. Thanks, Amari. Well, that's our show. For all of us here at Griffin Update, thank you for watching. For more news and information about Missouri Western and the surrounding region, tune into Griffin Update on Channel 39. Or catch us on our Griffin Update Vimeo channel and Missouri Western Student Media webpage.